Chapter Twenty One of Varney the Vampire, Volume One by Thomas Prescott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Schenker. Chapter Twenty One: The Conference Between the Uncle and Nephew, and the Alarm. Meanwhile, Charles Holland had taken his uncle by the arm and led him into a private room. Dear uncle, he said, be seated, and I will explain everything without reserve. Seated, nonsense! I'll walk about," said the admiral. "Darn me! I have no patience to be seated, and very seldom had or have. Go on now, you young scamp. Well, well, you abuse me, but I am quite sure. Had you been in my situation, you would have conducted your actions precisely as I have done. No, I shouldn't. Well, but uncle. Don't think to come over me by calling me uncle. Hark you, Charles! From this moment, I won't be your uncle any more. Very well, sir. It ain't very well. And how dare you, you buccaneer, call me sir? Eh? I say, how dare you? I will call you anything I like, but I won't be called anything I like. You might as well call me at once Morgan the pirate, for he was called anything he liked. Hello, sir! How dare you laugh? Eh? I'll teach you to laugh at me. I wish I had you on board ship. That's all, you young rascal. I'd soon teach you to laugh at your superior officer. I would. Oh, uncle, but I did not laugh at you. What did you laugh at then? At a joke. Joke? Darn me! There was no joke at all. Oh, very good. And it ain't very good. Charles knew very well that this sort of humor, in which the old general would soon pass away, and then that he would listen to him comfortably enough. So he would not allow the least exhibition of petulance and mere impotence to escape himself, but contented himself by waiting until the ebullition of feeling fairly worked itself out. Well, well, at length said the old man, you have dragged me here into a very small and very dull room, under pretense of having something to tell me, and I have heard nothing yet. Then I will tell you now," said Charles. I fell in love. Bah. With Flora Bannerworth abroad, she is not only the most beautiful of created beings, but but her mind is of the greatest order of intelligence, honor, candor, and all amiable feelings. But really, uncle, if you say "ba" in everything, I cannot go on. And what the deuce difference, sir, does it make to you whether I say "ba" or not? Well, I love her. She came to England, and as I could not exist, but was getting ill, and should no doubt have died if I had not done so, I came to England. But、uh, I want to know about the mermaid, the vampire. You mean, sir? Well, well, the vampire. Then, uncle, all I can tell you is that it is supposed a vampire came on one night and inflicted a wound upon Flora's neck with his teeth, and that he is still endeavoring to renew his horrible existence from the young pure blood that flows through her veins. The devil he is. Yes, I am bewildered. I must confess, by the mass of circumstances that have combined to give the affair a horrible truthfulness, poor Flora is much injured in health and spirits, and when I came home, she at once implored me to give her up, and think of her no more, for she could not think of allowing me to unite my faith with hers under such circumstances. She did. Such were her words, Uncle. She implored me. She used the word implore, to fly from her, to leave her to her fate, to endeavor to find happiness. With someone else, well, but I saw her heart was breaking. What of that? Much of what? Much of that, Uncle. I told her, when I had deserted her in the hour of misfortune, that I hoped heaven would desert me. I told her that if her happiness was wrecked, to cling yet to me, and that with that power and that strength God had given me, I would stand between her and all ill. And what then? She she fell upon my breast and wept and blessed me. Could I desert her? Could I say to her, "My dear girl, when you were full of health and beauty, I loved you, but now that sadness is in your heart, I leave you"? Could I tell her that, uncle, and yet call myself a man? No," roared the old admiral in a voice that made the room echo again. And I tell you what: if you had done so, darn you, you puppy, I'd have braced you and and married the girl myself. I would, dar, I would, dear uncle. Don't dear me, sir. Think of deserting a girl with the signal of distress in the shape of a tear, is in her eye. But I, 
You are a wretch, a confounded, blubberly boy, a swab, a dirge, old grumpus. You mistake, uncle. No, I don't. God bless you, Charles. You shall have her. If a ship's whole crew of vampires said no, you shall have her. Let me see her. Let me see her. The admiral gave his lips a vigorous wipe with his sleeve, and Charles said hastily, My dear uncle, you will recollect that Miss Bannersworth is quite a young lady. I suppose she is. Well, then, for God's sake, don't attempt to kiss her. Not kiss her, don't. They like it. Not kiss her because she's a young lady. No. Do you think I'd kiss a corporal of marines? No, uncle. But you know young ladies are very delicate. And ain't I delicate? Shiver me timbers, ain't I delicate? Where is she? That's what I want to know. Then you approve of what I have done. You are a young scamp, and you have got some of the old admiral's family blood in you. So don't take any credit for acting like an honest man. You couldn't help it. But if I had not so acted, said Charles with a smile, what would have become of the family blood then? What's that to you? I would have disowned you, because that very thing would have convinced me you were an impostor, and did not belong to the family at all. Well, that would have been one way of getting over the difficulty. No difficulty at all. The man who deserts, the good ship that carries him through the waves, or the girl who trusts her heart to him, ought to be cropped off into meat or for wild monkeys. Well, I think so, too. Of course you do. Why, what course? Because it's so d -d -d reasonable that, being a nephew of mine, you can't possibly help it. Brave, uncle. I had no idea you were so argumentative. Hadn't you a spoony? You'd be an ornament in the gun-room, you would. But there's the young lady with so infernal delicate. Where is she, I say? I'll fetch her, uncle. Ah, oh, do I'll be bound now. She's one of the right build. A good figurehead, and don't make too much stern away. Well, well, whatever you do, don't pay her any compliments, for your efforts in the line are such a very doubtful order that I shall dread to hear you. You should be off and find your own business. I haven't been at sea forty years without picking up some out-and-out -out delicate compliments to say to the young lady. But do you really imagine now that the deck of a man of war is a nice place to pick up courtly compliments, then? Of course I do. There you hear the best language, and oh, you don't know what you are talking about. You fellows have stuck on shore all your lives. It's we seamen who learn life. Well, well, hark! What's that? A cry. Did you hear a cry? A signal of distress. By good. In their efforts to leave the room, the uncle and the nephew were about a minute actually blocked by the doorway. But the superior bulk of the admiral prevailed, and after nearly squeezing poor Charles flat, he got out first. But this did not avail him, for he knew not where to go. Now the second scream which Flora had uttered when the vampire had clasped her waist came upon in their ears, and as they were outside the room, it acted well as a guide in which direction to come. Charles fancied correctly through at once that it proceeded from the room which was called Flora's own room, and thither ward, accordingly, he dashed at tremendous speed. Henry, however, happened to be nearer at hand, and, moreover, he did not hesitate a moment, because he knew that Flora was in her own room, so he reached it first, and Charles saw him rush in a few moments before he could reach the room. The difference in time, however, was very slight, and Henry had only just raised Flora from the floor as Charles appeared. "'God of heaven!' cried the latter. "'What has happened?' "'I know not,' said Henry. "'As God is my judge, I know not. "'Flora! Flora! Speak to us! Flora! Flora!' "'She has fainted,' cried Charles. "'Some water may restore her. "'Oh, Henry! Henry! Is not this terrible?' "'Courage!' "'Courage!' said Henry, though his voice betrayed what a terrible state of anxiety he was himself in. "'You will find water in that decanter, Charles. "'Here is my mother, too. Another visit. God help us!' Miss Bannerworth sat down on the edge of the sofa which was in the room, and could only wring her hands and weep. "'Avast!' cried the Admiral, making his appearance. "'Where's the enemy, lads?' "'Uncle,' said Charles. "'Uncle! Uncle! The vampire has been here again! The dreadful vampire!' on me, and he's gone too, and carried half the window with him. Look here. It was literally true. The window which had long latticed one was smashed through. Help! Oh, help! said Flora, as the water was dashed in her face began to recover her. You are safe, said Henry. You are safe. 
Flora, said Charles, do you know my voice, dear Flora? Look up and you will see there are none here but those who love you. Flora opened her eyes timidly as she said, Has it gone? Yes, yes, dear, said Charles, look around you. There are none but true friends. And tried friends, my dear, said Admiral Bell, excepting me. And whenever you like to try me afloat or ashore, darn me, shoo old Nick himself, and I won't shrink. Yard arm and yard arm, grapnel and grapnel, pitch pots and grenades. This is my uncle, Flora, said Charles. I thank you, sir, said Flora faintly. All right, whispered the Admiral to Charles. What a figurehead to be sure. Pull at Swansea would have made just about fort of her. But she wasn't so delicate. Darn me! I should think not. You are right for once to say, Charlie. What was it that alarmed you, said Charles, tenderly, as he now took one of Flora's hands in his? Varney! Varney the vampire! Varney! exclaimed Henry. Varney, here! Yes, he came in at that door, and when I screamed, I suppose, for I hardly was conscious, he darted out through the window. This, said Henry, is beyond all human patience. By heaven, I cannot and will not endure it. It shall be my quarrel, said Charles. I shall go at once and defy him. He shall meet me. Oh, no, 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 said Flora, as she clung convulsively to Charles. No, no, there is a better way. What way? That place has become full of terrors. Let us leave it. Let him, as he wishes, have it. Let him have it? Yes, yes, God knows if it purchase an immunity from these visits, we may well be overjoyed. Remember that we have ample reasons to believe him more than human. Why should you allow yourselves to risk a personal encounter with such a man, who might be glad to kill you, that he might have an opportunity of replenishing his own hideous existence with your best heart's blood? The young men looked aghast. Besides, added Flora, you cannot tell what dreadful powers of mischief he may have against such human courage might be of no avail. There is truth and reason, said Mr. Marchdale, stepping forward, in what Flora says. Only let me come across him, that's all, said Admiral Bell, and I'll soon find out what he is. I suppose he's some long slab of lubber, after all, ain't he, with no strength? His strength is immense, said Marchdale. I tried to seize him, and I fell beneath his arm as if I had been struck by the hammer of a cyclops. A what? cried the admiral. A cyclops. Darn me, I served aboard the cyclops seven years, and never saw a very big hammer aboard of her. What on earth is to be done? said Henry. Oh, chimed in the admiral, there's something a bother about what's to be done on earth. Now at sea, I could soon tell you what is to be done. We must hold a solemn constitution over this matter, said Henry. You are safe now, Flora. Oh, be ruled by me. Give up a haul. You tremble. I do tremble, brother, for what may yet ensue. I implore you to give up the hall. It is such a terror to us now. Give it up. Have no more to do with it. Let us take terms with Sir Francis Varney. Remember, we dare not kill him. He might be smothered, said the Admiral. It is true, marked Henry. You dare not, even holding all the terrible suspicions we do, take his life. By foul means, certainly not, said Charles. We are ten times a vampire. I cannot, however, believe that he is so vulnerable as he is represented. No one represents him here, said Marchdale. I speak, sir, because I saw you glance at me. I only know that, having made two successful attempts to seize him, he eluded me. Once by leaving in my grasp a piece of his coat, and next time he struck me down, and I still feel the effects of the terrific blow. You hear? said Flora. Yes, I hear, said Charles. For some reason, added Marchdale, in a tone of emotion, what it, I say seems to fall always badly upon Mr. Holland's ear. I know not why, but if it will give him any satisfaction, I will leave Bannerworth Hall to-night. No, 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 said Henry. For the love of heaven, do not let us quarrel. Hear, hear, cried the Admiral. We can never fight the enemy well if the ship's crew are in bad terms. Come now, you Charles. This appears to be an honest, gentlemanly fellow. Give him your hand. If Mr. Charles Holland, said Marchdale, knows aught to my prejudice in any way, however slight, I here beg of him to declare it at once, and openly. I cannot assert that I do, said Charles. Then what the deuce do you make yourself agreeable for, eh? cried the general. 
"'One cannot help one's impression and feelings,' said Charles. "'But I am willing to take Mr. Marchdale's hand.' "'And I yours, young sir,' said Marchdale, "'in all sincerity of spirit, and with good will towards you.' They shook hands, but it required no conjurer to perceive that it was not done willingly or cordially. It was a handshaking of that character which seemed to imply on each side, "'I do not like you, but I don't know positively any harm of you.' "'There now,' said the Admiral, "'that's better. Now let us hold counsel with this Varney,' said Henry. "'Come to the parlour, all of you, and we will endeavour to come to some decided arrangement. "'Do not weep, mother,' said Flora. "'All may be well. We will leave this place. "'We will consider that question, Flora,' said Henry. "'And believe me, your wishes will go a long way with all of us, "'as you may well suppose they always would.' "'They left Mrs. Bannerworth with Flora, "'and proceeded to the small oaken parlour, "'in which were the elaborate and beautiful carvings "'which have been before mentioned. "'Henry's countenance, perhaps, "'wore the most determined expression of all.' He appeared now as if he had thoroughly made up his mind to do something which should have a decided tendency to put a stop to the terrible scenes which were now, day by day, taking place beneath that roof. Charles Holland looked serious and thoughtful, as if he were revolving some course of action in his mind concerning which he was not very clear. Mr. Marchdale was more sad and depressed, to all appearance, than any of them. As for the Admiral, he was evidently in a state of amazement and knew not what to think. He was anxious to do something, and yet what that was to be he had not the most remote idea, any more than as if he was not at all cognizant of any of these circumstances, yet one of which was so completely out of the line of his former life and experience. George had gone to call Mr. Chillingworth, so he was not present at the first part of this serious council of war. End of chapter 21 Recorded by Mark Schenker AudioU.com. You can also find me on Voice123.com. Wexford, Pennsylvania. This is Good Friday, March 21st, 2008.